So um, I'm actually working at the Department of Pediatrics, but I am a child psychiatrist, and I've been uh, uh, running an OCD and tick clinic for probably about 20-something years. Um, I do a lot of uh, Tourette's trials, um, so I'm very familiar with the concept of medications. I'll go over that later. Uh, but I, I have uh, nobody's sort of buying my, my opinion or, or time. So Dr. Sweeto uh, did a very nice overview of the PANS pandas, and, and I won't try to duplicate much of what she was saying. But when you see these children, um, they are different than the typical psychiatric patient that I see in that they present just diffusely and, and globally uh, quite ill. Um, so one of the things that you want to do if you're assessing one of these children is look at all the individual symptoms, uh, not just uh, what the family's reporting to you, but also do a physical, uh, listen to the other uh, symptoms such as the urinary symptoms, the uh, joint symptoms, uh, uh, memory issues, and so forth, because they have uh, a lot of different presentations. Um, that said, if they have something that seems very atypical, like trouble walking, then obviously they need a neuro neurology referral. If they have, like what appears to be inflammatory joint pain, they need a rheumatology referral. And I think we heard from the earlier speakers that getting all the uh, team on board for these children is really hard, and I have a really hard time as a child psychiatrist often coordinating that and pulling it together when I see these children. Um, if they have abnormalities, if they're echo, um, you know, because if they have a lot of movements and odd behaviors and so forth, it's probably not a bad idea to get an echo. And if they have an abnormal echo, then this is not uh, PANS. This is probably Sinehams Korea. Uh, if the uh, MRI is abnormal or if they have abnormal metabolic labs, then it's not PANS or PANDAS. <coughs> Uh, a lot of the children that I see have actually had very um, poor response to psychiatric therapies in the past, uh, and they actually seem to get worse sometimes on psychiatric therapy, so it's really important to get that history as well. This is a sample of children that I saw, um, and they had to meet the criteria for PANS, acute onset OCD. Uh, they couldn't have a tick primary presentation. Uh, and they couldn't have a mood disorder primary presentation, but they had to have acute, severe, uh, sudden onset of OCD. What we found is that these children tend to be very young. Their average age was 7.9. Um, they, they had uh, the acute onset where most children that I see with regular OCD have a sort of a gradual, you know, chronic kind of ramping up of their symptoms. These children had a higher family history of uh, autoimmunity and a lot of them actually had some autoimmune disorders themselves. Uh, a lot of them had histories of allergies or asthma, uh, and so this needs to be addressed as well. Uh, and I think we heard from Melissa uh, that the frequent strep uh, history that her family had, uh, about three quarters of these had frequent uh, tonsillitis in their history, and many of them had frequent upper respiratory infections. So the other thing that I do, which is probably atypical for most child psychiatrists, I actually do immune deficiency workup pretty much on all of my patients and also look at some of the autoimmune uh, parameters as well. And this is just uh, my sample uh, showing the psychiatric and neurological symptoms that they presented with. Uh, they all had anxiety and emotional ability uh, on top of having the OCD. Sleep problems were in the majority. Uh, handwriting deterioration was in over half. Uh, weight loss and food refusal was in about a half of the children. 20% uh, of my sample actually had psychotic symptoms. And 23% of the parents reported the, the dilated pupils finding that Melissa described very well earlier. Strep was the most common reported trigger and exposure was very common in their history as well. 72% uh, of them had both uh, either, either ASO or DNA speed titers that were elevated. And this is, and I didn't screen for infection trigger in this sample. These are just children coming to me with a complaint of sudden onset OCD, and this is what we found. And I think, and Melissa did it so beautifully, but these families' quality of life is just 
hit incredibly hard by this illness, and these children just tank in every domain of quality of life, even their physical health, family cohesion, uh, uh, emotional well-being, and a third of my children were actually already on homebound education because they were too ill to go to school. So um, Dr. Cooper's is going to talk more about some of the treatment, um, but the treatment uh, that we've seen so far, and, and we ha I have a study that should be published hopefully in the next few months, is that antibiotics help uh, quite a bit in most of the children. And then they often need other therapies such as uh, steroids, IVIG or plasma exchange, non-steroidals and so forth. But even when I've put all the best efforts towards some of these children, some of them do not come back to their baseline. And so then you need to apply other therapies in place. And those are the therapies I was trained most on, uh, behavioral therapies and psychiatric medications. And, and as I mentioned, PANS is like, you know, it's a, it's a multidisciplinary type illness. Uh, I think uh, we, we really need a team to, to help treat these children. We need rheumatologists, we need infectious disease, immunologists, neurologists, and so forth. And what I approach from my angle is I try to get them, you know, tapped into all these types of ther uh, therapies and, and specialties. And then I do what I consider a sort of a staged multimodal treatment approach. And that's where you deal with the infection first, get it out of the way, then you deal with the autoimmunity, then you deal with the behavior, and then if you need to, you treat them with psychiatric medications as a last resort. There are many symptoms to treat. Um, these are not just children presenting with usually one domain being affected. They have multiple symptoms across the board, which makes it very tricky because even in psychiatric treatment, you don't have one medication that targets all symptoms. And so this makes it a very complex presentation to deal with. So the non-immune interventions, I think uh, realizing that these families are really in crisis mode, their child has changed before their eyes overnight, they are scared. I actually say that a lot of them, my parents have, you know, PANDAS PTSD because they're so afraid of this happening again to their child. So I think you need to work with improving the family cohesion, getting them the support, follow up uh, um, and seeing them more often. And then optimize the nutrition. Some of these children have uh, poor diets because of food refusal and so forth. And they also have vitamin deficiencies, which might help them get better if it's treated. Um, and the standard therapies do work for these children. Just need a little bit of different approach, but they do work. CBT is cognitive behavioral therapy. It's a specialized treatment for OCD. And this was probably going to work best for the families once they're out of that encephalitic phase. Because once they're in the middle of it, it's just, they're not remembering anything. They're just too overwhelmed. But once they kind of start to calm down a little bit, and you know, the immune treatments are taking effect and so forth, it sort of teaches families uh, skills that they can use and they can adapt and to help deal with the, the overwhelming OCD and behavior and so forth. Some of the children where they might have been very sweet, adorable, you know, cuddly children, in the course of this illness become, you know, rageful and oppositional and families need therapies to help deal with this. Where do they draw the line on discipline versus letting it slide? So there is some evidence base for treating OCD and ticks with various uh, psychiatric medications. Uh, one thing that I would like to point out is that a lot of the psychiatric medications often have immune modulating um, uh, effects that, that actually uh, may help some of the presentation in the immune aspect in addition to the neuropsychiatric aspect. Some of the original actually psychiatric medications were derived from antimicrobials. Um, they may not tolerate typical doses and I almost kind of got a little nervous with the 25 milligrams of sertraline that your little guy was started on. But sometimes they get more activated and more out of control on uh, too high of doses. So I usually start them on really, really small doses and go up gradually. And because these children are often on other medications, always consider drug-drug interactions. Because uh, like azithromycin can cause prolonged QTC, as can some of the psychiatric medications. When you say low, do you mean five or two? 6.25. 6.25. 
That's what I usually start, yeah. So in summary, multidisciplinary evaluation is uh, often necessary. Immune-based therapies are given first to remove the infection, decrease the autoimmunity. <coughs> Behavioral therapies, once they're out of the crisis phase, uh, to help families have strategies to deal with these children. Uh, pharmacologic effects can be helpful in some. Um, careful with dosing and as much as feasible treat with one new medication at a time. Let's stop there.